Welcome again to our lectures on statistics. The lecture is being delivered for the students of the Department of English and German Languages, whose major is Foreign Language to Foreign Languages. The theme of this lecture is Peculiar Use of Set Expressions. The outline of the lecture includes the following points. First, general information about the peculiar use of set expressions. Second, cliché. The third, proverbs and sayings. The fourth, epigrams. And the fifth, illusion. As we have considered in previous lectures, lexical stylistic devices can be divided according to three criteria. The interaction of different types of lexical meaning, intensification of a feature, and peculiar use of set expressions. In language studies, there are two clearly marked tendencies. The analytical, which seeks to dissever one component from another, and the synthetic tendency, which seeks to integrate the parts of the combination into a stable unit. In lexicology, the parts of a stable lexical unit may be separated in order to make a scientific investigation of the character of the combination and to analyze the components. In stylistics, we analyze the component parts in order to get at some communicative effect sought by the writer. It is this communicative effect and the means employed to achieve it that lie within the domain of stylistics. Well, the group indicated according to this criterion includes the following stylistic devices, cliches, proverbs and sayings, quotations, allusion, epigrams. We'll consider each of them in more detail. A cliché is a saying, idea, or element of artistic work that is overused in a culture to the point of losing its original, more significant meaning. Clichés often are annoying to a listener or reader in that they display a lack of originality on the part of the speaker or writer. Some cliches are also examples of idiom that are simply far too commonly used in the language. The word cliché comes from French and it is an onomatopoeic word for the sound of using a metal printing plate. Interestingly, this printing plate was also known as a stereotype Thus, the definition of cliché comes from the idea that the printing plates printed the same words repeatedly. There are thousands of examples of cliché in English. Other languages have their own clichés. Microcultures can have their own clichéd words, such as on college campuses, where students overuse the same intelligent-sounding words such as heuristic or problematize. The words may be appropriate in some cases, but also may be used in a way that paradoxically hints at the student's lack of original thinking. Here are some common examples of cliché in English. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. I'm like a kid in a candy store. I lost track of time. Roses are red, violets are blue. Time heals all wounds. We are not laughing at you. We are laughing with you. Play your cards right. Read between the lines.
Cliches are important because they express ideas and thoughts that are widespread and common within a culture. Cliches can be very common in popular books, poems, movies, television shows, speeches, and advertisements. It is important to remember that every cliché was once original and became overused only because it was such a popular idea at first. So, many clichés come from classic works. Many clichés have their origins in classics like Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. A rose by any other name would smell as sweet. This cliché is from Juliet's speech in which she claims that it does not matter that Romeo comes from her family's enemy house, the Montague. Like many Shakespeare quotes, this phrase was so creative when Shakespeare wrote it that now other people have overused it to mean that the names of things are not important compared to their qualities. Forever and a day, this cliche, this cliche is also derived from Shakespeare as it first appeared in The Taming of the Shroom. Countless cliches were coined by Shakespeare, including all that glitters is not gold, from the Merchant of Venice. Jealousy is the green-eyed monster, from Othello. Melted in the thin air, from the Tempest. It is a compliment for a writer's work to become a cliché, but it is an insult to be accused of writing something cliché. Proverbs and sayings. So what are proverbs and sayings? A proverb and sayings are, are a short saying embodying some general truth or moral precept which has gained permanence and often being used in the common speech. Proverbs and sayings could be an impersonal observation on life couched in a few telling words made more effective, perhaps by rhyme, rhythm, alliteration, or rhythmic balance. Proverbs and sayings are usually common to all races and nationalities. Proverbs and sayings, when spoken in the right context, could make you sound wiser. They are often metaphorical. A proverb that describes a basic rule of conduct may also be known as a maxim. If a proverb is distinguished by particularly good style, it may be known as an aphorism. The examples of proverbs are as following. A bad workman always blames his tools. A bargain is a bargain. A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Proverbs and sayings are facts of language. They are collected in dictionaries. There are special dictionaries of proverbs and sayings. It is impossible to arrange proverbs and sayings in a form that would present a pattern, even though they have some typical features by which it is possible to determine whether or not we are dealing with one. These typical features are as following. Alliteration, for example, forgive and forget. Parallelism, nothing ventured, nothing gained. Rhyme. When the cat is away, the mice will play. An ellipsis. Once bitten, twice shy. These are the typical stylistic features of proverbs. And internal features that can be found quite frequently include hyperbole. All is fair in love and war. Paradox. The longest way around is the shortest way home. And personification. Hunger is the best cook. The next stylistic device is epigrams. An epigram is a short poem with a clever twist at the end or a concise and witty statement. They are among the best examples of the power of poetry to compress insight and wit. Epigram is in origin a Greek word, epigraman written upon, and the Western tradition of epigram ultimately looks back to Greek literary models. 
As the name indicates, though, epigram began as poems inscribed on votive offerings at sanctuaries, including statues of athletes, and on funerary monuments. Go tell it to the Spartans passerby. These original epigrams did the same job as a short prose text might have done, but in verse. Epigram became a literary genre in the Hellenistic period. In early English literature, the short couplet poem was dominated by the poetic epigram and proverb. Since 1600, two successive lines of verse that rhyme with each other, known as a couplet, featured as a part of the longer sonnet form, most notably in William Shakespeare's sonnets. Sonnet number 76 is an excellent example. The two-line poetic form as a closed couplet was also used by William Blake, Blake in his poem Aquarius of Innocence and later by Byron, John Gay and Alexander Pope. In the early part of the 20th century, a short image form of the poetic epigrams was created by Adelaide Crapsey, whereby she codified this couplet form into a two-line rhymed verse of ten syllables per line. What is an epigram? A dwarfish whole, its body brevity and wit its soul. I am tired of love, I am still more tired of rhyme, but money gives me pleasure all the time. And the last stylistic device we are going to consider within this group is illusion. An illusion is a figure of speech that makes a reference to or representation of a place, event, literary work, myth, or work of art, either directly or by implication. It is, gener it is usually an implicit reference perhaps to another work of literature or art, to a person or an event. An illusion may enrich the work by associating and give it depth. Abrams defined illusion as a brief reference, explicit or indirect, to a person, place or event, or to another literary work or passage. Thus, illusion is a reference to an object or circumstance that has occurred or existed in an external context. In the most traditional sense, illusion is the use of previous texts, though the word also has come to include references to or from any source, including film, art, music, or real events. An illusion may be drawn from history, geography, literature, or religion. Illusions in writing help the reader to visualize what's happening by evoking a mental picture. But the reader must be aware of the illusion and must be familiar with what it alludes to. Allusions are commonly made to the Bible, nursery rhymes, myths, famous fictional or historical characters or events, or writers, for example, Shakespeare. This is all in brief concerning the content of this lecture. As a rule, you are offered to answer these comprehension questions, to check your understanding of the content of this lecture. Some of them include giving examples of this or that stylistic device. And as usual, you are given a list of sources that can be used 
for further reading. Thank you for attention.